next speaker is Lucy O'Brien, Professor of Philosophy at UCL, and she'll be talking to us about getting out of your head, addiction, and the motive of self-escape. Okay, so so I'm going to talk about um, this is a this is a uh, discussion of a paper that I jointly wrote with Daniel Morgan, who's in Barcelona. And it connects to stuff that we've both been working on. Daniel's been working more on desire. And I've been working on, well, I've been, I mean, all I've ever worked on is, is self-consciousness. Is, you know, what it's like to be me. You might think it's a narcissistic program, probably. <laughs> but philosophers, when they tend to talk about self-consciousness, have concentrated on reflective self-consciousness, consciousness of your own thoughts, and that's kind of kept us busy for a couple hundred years. More recently, so I've tried to look at self-consciousness in agency, um, but I'm now trying to think about ways in which we're to ourselves. It's a form of self-consciousness, but it's mediated by the consciousness of others. So it's consciousness of yourself, as it were, through apprehensions of various ways of the consciousness of others. And I want to look at the ways in which that kind of form of apprehending ourselves um, enters into our experience, but also our behaviours and so on. Okay, that's the subjectivity bit. The agency and morality bit. Well, I mean, as Scott reminded us, <laughs> Yesterday, actually, a lot of the most egregious things we do, we do, as it were, morally. We do it in accordance with our standards and, and rules. We just might have the wrong rules. But most of the things that, I mean, well, a lot of the things we do that we shouldn't do, we do, as it were, knowingly. We do because we're weak and impulsive. So we, we do things we don't want to do and we think we ought to do. And it seems to me the addiction is particularly a kind of core case of behaviour that people carry out, not wanting to carry out, and not thinking that they ought to carry out. And I want to try and make sense of this. So when you look at neuroscientific, well, one of the bits I can understand, the neuroscientific um, the neuroscientific work on addiction, and do you do when you look about the philosophical work on addiction, there's one thing that no one kind of talks about, which is that alcohol, alcohol's going to be my main, but other drugs, change what it's like to be conscious. They're intoxicating. They <coughs> They, they get you out of your head, right? They take you away from it. They change what it is like to be a conscious being. And that fact, it seems to me, must play some role in why they, we, we over-consume them in, in various ways. So that's really my question. And I think there's a particular role that they play, which I call they facilitate self-escape. They in some way allow you to get away from yourself. That I want to ask, is that, is that playing a role in, in addictive behavior? So I'm going to start by asking, I'm not going to talk about what I think addictive behavior is, I'm going to talk about what I think an addictive desire is. And it seems to me that there's sort of two features. The first feature, is what I call the personal level addictive dysfunction K, we call that. I mean, many desires, we all have desires to do things, eat cakes and so on, that we shouldn't do. But usually if someone tells you, no, you're really, something really terrible will happen, right? That cupcake, it's not just going to make you a little bit fatter, you're going to die if you eat that cupcake. Most of us will no longer be tempted to eat the cup. But addictive desires seem to have a, this is a technical notion, you'll act on them even when the outcome is terrible. Right? Not just unfortunate or non-optimal, but terrible. 
So they're strong enough to act on in ways that we think are terrible. And they're in to that extent dysfunctional. Okay, but there are other desires that actually we don't think of as addictive desires that can to act on can, can result in terrible actions. You know, people sleep with people they shouldn't, that ruins their whole life. We don't tend to unless they keep doing it, we don't tend to think of that as an addictive desire. We just think it's an overpoweringly strong one. So what makes it a desire? I think the other feature that we think of as addictive desires is that there's something systematic about the causes. They're, they're in some way sustained by a similar kind of cause. So to that extent, I mean, philosophers have the, the notion of a natural kind term. It's, they're not just any old desires with other features, but there's some sort of core structure that they have. Okay, so the question as to why, you know, what's the sustaining causes or mechanism that makes addictive desires so strong, so strong so that we do terrible things when we have them? Well, the neurophysiological story is that well, when we look at addictive substances, they have this, all of them, as far as I can work out, have... Um, I'll say most of them, and then the captions on this. Most of them have this, this property that they stimulate dopamine release or they decrease the dopamine uptake. The bottom line is they make more dopamine available to the brain. And I, I'm no neurophysiologist, but I can see it would be a ginormous, it would be a huge coincidence if that were the case, if that was the active ingredient in various addictive substances, it would be a huge a coincidence if it didn't play some role in explaining the strength of addictive desires. Okay, but that's... There's something farther that the neurophysiological work I've looked at on addiction claims. And that is, well, what do they claim? They claim that addictive desires <coughs> are not just very strong and not just correlated with more amounts of dopamine that are available, but in some way they're decoupled from pleasure or from liking states or relief from pain states. So, Berridge and Robinson's rats, I don't know how many of you are acquainted with their rats, but their rats have amphetamine in their brains. They're given a mechanism to release sugar. And rats without amphetamine with their brain take a certain amount of sugar. Rats with amphetamine in their brains just take loads more sugar. And they also, Berridge and Robinson, have a test for how much the rats like sugar. I mean, this is, I find this utterly adorable. Apparently rats have characteristic kind of like, you know, lip-licking characteristics that they use to judge how much the rats like sugar. So I'm... So, so there's an interesting sort of move, again, it's the kind of not talking about the effects of these substances. There's an interesting move to suggest that we have these, what I call mere dopamine desires. These, I, I call them that to get away with the debate on whether they're, they're in sentence salient desires or their, their states of the reward learning system, there in some way, error, indicators, and so on. So I'm just going to call them mere dopamine desires. Um, and that they're desires that make people act irrespective of what they like or what gives them pleasure or what gives them relief from pain. So here's a nice quotation. Richard Holton has picked up the work 
Work by Robinson and Marriage indicate that addiction involves very roughly a decoupling of wanting and liking. Stand and mean once we like something, or believe we like it and we want it, and conversely, once we don't like it, or believe we will not, we don't want it, addicts are different. Okay, I want to do two things. I want to say, I'm not sure that we've got really solid evidence from these cases to suggest that. Uh, so as what, what philosophers' jobs, they make trouble and they raise hypotheses. So I'm going to first of all try and make raise trouble for this suggestion and then I'm going to raise a, a hypothesis. I'm going to, the room for raising the hypothesis is going to come from the fact that even if Farage and Robinson are right, I think there's room for alternative causal mechanisms and indeed a need to talk about alternative causal mechanisms. So first of all, the trouble. Um, Barrett and, and Robinson and Holton following the claim that, that addictive desires, mere do dopamine desires, are dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional in a very particular way. Well, in order to get to the way in which they're dysfunctional, let's look at what a functional desire is. It seems to me there are three connections that we can appeal to. When, you know, when we think of what's a desire for and when is it functioning well, well, take a substance, and a substance is desirable if it's good for the subject in some way. Uh, it's good for them, it gives them pleasure, it constitutes their well-being, constitutes perhaps the survival of their group, and so on. Connection two, a substance S brings A for some animal pleasure or relief from pain. And connection three, pleasure giving substances feed into our desire system. And our desire systems feed into what we then go on to act. So actually there's a number of places at which you could have dysfunctional desires. Um, so you could have substances bringing you pleasure that in no way are good for you. I mean, arguably, we're in a position now of, of in, in, ingesting substances, often that give us pleasure, sugar, for example, that is no longer really good for us, or certainly not in the abundance it's now available. Um, connection three could break down. You could have pleasure-giving substances that fail to fix desires. Uh, and actually, you can have then a failure to act on desires. So there's a fourth connection. Berridge and Robinson are claiming that addictive substances give rise to desires. They give rise to uh, desires that motivate action, but without them being correlated with pleasure or like. So they, in some way, a well-functioning desire, as it were, goes through the pleasure system, or comes out of the pleasure system. Barrage and Robinson are claiming that addictive substances, as it were, bypass, uh, they hijack the dopamine system, and as a result, fix desires directly, as it were, chemically. They, they chemically induce desires rather than going through the pleasure system. Okay, I just want to raise a quick question about this before I go on to talk about what other um, elements might be involved in addictive desire. Okay, first of all the thing to say is if addictive desires work just like this, through the immediate activity on the dopamine system, it would, I mean, we want to go back to that initial thought, just as it would be a massive coincidence if high dopamine spikes were correlated with addictive desire. It would be a massive coincidence if the forms of intoxication <coughs> pleasure that addictive substances give weren't correlated with addictive desires. Now, 
Barrage and Robinson don't claim that addictive substances don't also bring pleasure. They just claim that the substances have a way of uh, affecting the desire system and securing these kind of special incentive salients or dopamine desires that aren't correlated to pleasure. But I want to look at that claim. Why do they think that? They think that because the la rats don't lick their lips anymore, roughly speaking. They go after the sugar, but they don't show any more of the objective indicators of pleasure. And the very simple question really is, why think that we've got any objective indicators of pleasure in this case? So let me make a distinction between taste pleasure and amphetamine pleasure, right? We've got a measure, let's say we've got a measure of taste pleasure for the rats. We've got some objective, how much they lick their lips, depends on how much pleasure, taste pleasure, or Barry Smith would tell me off, how much flavor pleasure they get from <laughs> sugar. But they've got amphetamine in their brain. So we don't know, we really don't know what other forms of pleasure. I mean, maybe amphetamine is a pleasure multiplier. Maybe it's, it's not going to produce more taste pleasure, but there might be other forms of intoxicating pleasure that come from ingesting sugar when you're off your head on amphetamines. And we don't have any measure on that. Now, we can't talk to the rat. Um, we can talk to addicts, and there's often a rider in this discussion. The way addicts say things like, well, I don't enjoy alcohol as much as I used to. I don't enjoy heroin as much as I used to. But I think we need to look at those reports very carefully. The notion of, uh, of um, pleasure isn't just pleasure, it's pleasure and relief from pain. So it may well be that with continued use, addictive substances start to, as it were, change their pleasure profile. But in order to make the disproportionality claim, you'd have to say the whole profile, the amount of relief from pain and pleasure. And surprise, because there might be pleasure and surprise that they no longer get. It may might be, uh, and so on. But so you'd have to make that. Okay, is there a serious disagreement? Well, no, I don't think so, really. So, I think that from what I've read, the question as to whether the dopamine system, whether addictive substances hijack um, the pleasure system rather than simply producing, as it were, directly chemically induced desire, I think that's an open question. Or as Barry seems to suppose. But we all both agree that addictive desires seem to be correlated with high dopamine availability. And we both agree that that might be what makes them so strong, or one of the things that, that underlines their strength. I think it might be proportional to pleasure and relief from pain, whereas Barry just is. We both agree they're disproportional in that they're not good for us. They lead to, as it were, us to act on in terrible ways. Okay, but this, even if we give Farage the whole story, there's still a question. I mean, I think there's still an explanatory gap. Why is that? Well, I mean, notice that, that Barrage didn't choose, as it were, he, he, he just took any old rat. They weren't high susceptibility to addiction rats. And they all behaved in roughly the same way. Okay. Um, we all have similar brains. There are differences. But even when we look at identical twins, so it's pretty clear that even people with genetically similar brain, genetically identical, at least at the start, maybe slightly different by the time. 
they get um, to, to in producing, in, ingesting lots of alcohol. But studies on identical compared to fraternal twins make it quite clear that your brain type isn't determinative of whether or not you have addictive desires, or certainly whether you act with addictive desires. So whatever the story is about addiction, given that, at least within these groups, we'll make the assumption that their dopamine system is going to operate in roughly the same way, there must be an extra story to tell about why some people form addictive desires and don't others, because well, I'm just going to assume that addictive substances act in exactly the same way. So if they're going to do their direct chemical work and induce these kind of addictive desires, then they're going to do it equally across these, these um, identical Okay, there's also the point that we seem to have very good evidence that social factors, uh, social factors such as abuse, stress, shame, are predictors of addictive behavior. Anybody who works seriously with uh, addicts will tell you that there are patterns in their life stories, that they have, uh, uh, that, that there are levels of sort of shame and humiliation and so on that are correlated with their, their um, addictive behaviour. And therefore I'm assuming their addictive desires. Okay, so it can't all just be, I mean, it can't all be this just bypassing the, the, the pleasure system. I'm not making the claim here, by the way. It's not that I think the pleasure system isn't also realized neurophysiologically. It's just it's going to be realized neurophysiologically and perhaps... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be a one-one correlation. So, given that's the case, we need to consider both, what else? So if we think of addictive desires as the conscious desire that an addict has tries to resist and fails when they drink, I'm willing to start, suggest that one input for those desires is a kind of incentive salience or pure, pure dopamine. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be enough to do So what other kind of inputs might explain why addictive desires are so strong? Now there's been a tendency in philosophy to assume that our formula is going to be we've got a strong desire and then it's a question, it's all on the will side. Right? You have a desire of a certain strength and then the variability in our tendency to uh, intervene is going to be on, on the, the, the self-control side, capacity to not act on your strong desire. But I think we've got to leave open the question that the addict has stronger desires to drink. There's more that inputs into that desire, not that they have... Um... Okay. So... What, kind, what other kind of thing could input? Well, look, it's actually prosaic, outside the a kind of uh, monistic, neurophil oriented discussion of addiction. It's just prosaic to suggest that people have addictive desires because they have desires to escape, to remove themselves from shame, to... Uh, that, that, that their desires are in some way rooted in uh, emotional reactions of fear or guilt or shame or humiliation. And I'm just going to explore that. So the, the suggestion I'm going to make is that another systematic 
cause of addictive desires is a motive for self-escape. Self-escape from what? Self-escape from what I'll call negative self-consciousness. Negative self-consciousness can come in, I mean, it's, it's come in, in a number of, of uh, varieties, but the kind of negative self-consciousness I want to narrow in on is negative social self-consciousness, negative consciousness of oneself as in some way degraded or of lower standing or failing to uh, meet the, the demands of your social group, failing to meet <coughs> and so on. Now on the tests for degrees of, of, of self-consciousness, social psychology seems to, to separate private from public self-consciousness. Public self-consciousness being <coughs> Uh, self-consciousness about one's clothes or one's externalities in some way, and private self-consciousness about one's faith, one's, one's thoughts and one's... Uh, self-consciousness of features that one has when one's on one's own. I think actually, if you look at the categorization, you can, get, you can come to be privately self-conscious in their sense through interaction other people, so I'll leave that aside. But if you just want to think of it as, as, uh, uh, as public self-consciousness, we can talk about that. <coughs> so, if I'm right that there's a kind of negative <coughs> self-consciousness that comes from a discomfort with oneself, that's, that, that, that one comes through through <coughs> unsatisfactory interaction with one's social group, then I think it's clear that it's going to be painful and it's going to be exhausting. And that there's going to be a motive to release oneself from that. And I think it's also clear that addictive substances are capable of securing that kind of release. Okay, because the t I mean, I've <coughs> okay, so my claim is that high levels of both private self-consciousness and public self-consciousness, when associated with negative circumstances and appraisals, can be painful and can motivate a tendency to seek self-escape through alcohol. And our suggestion is that addictive substances secure that self-escape and that subjects are motivated to do so. What's my evidence? Well, I'm nearly out of time. <laughs> and anyway, I'm the philosopher in the sandwich, so do I have to give evidence? <laughs> I think there is, I think there is evidence. I, well, my first bit of evidence, get drunk, take notes. <laughs> right? It's, it's absolutely clear that one thing that you walk into a room, you feel really shy, those of us who drink will know one of the reasons that we pick up a drink, quite consciously actually, is in order to disinhibit ourselves, in order to remove that sense of shyness of the social group. So get up, take notes. And then actually I think there's some fairly solid, so whole, whole self-awareness model of, of alcoholism uh, provides us, I think, with, with some data. We can talk about that in questions. Very interesting data from Muller Goldstein on lack of self-consciousness in addicts and then recoveries to higher than average rates afterwards. Evidence for two, evidence that people seek uh, alcohol or other drugs in order to secure self-escape. Again, decide to have a drink, take notes. Um, but I think Hull also has a number, and then a lot of the literature on shame and so on makes it very, very plausible that, that that's what's going on. Where are we? Well, I'll tell you, tell you where we are. Okay, I just want to say, you know, one way we could test, one way we could test the extent to which the motive for self-esteem is operating in addictive design 
is to think, I mean, I think David Nutt's already done this, but, but not got the license for it. Let's say we <laughs> produce two substances. I call them alcohol and alcohol. Okay. Alcohol is going to act directly on the dopamine system. But it's not going to get you out of your head. It's not going to get you drunk. It's not going to give you any of the phenomenological changes of consciousness. Alcohol is going to get you absolutely tipsy and, and your self-consciousness will fall away, but it's not going to affect <coughs> the dopamine system. And then our question is going to be, will human beings get addicted to these substances? Hmm. If the original Barrage account is right, then they shouldn't. Yeah. Um, or at least they should get addicted to the first one, but not addicted to the second one. I think it's an open question. I mean, <laughs> my, my, my guess is they'll get addicted to both. But on the marriage story, they shouldn't get addicted to the second. They shouldn't get addicted to the second. Addictive design, it doesn't have the systematic causal base that you require for addictive desires. And I think it has an alternative systematic causal base that could underline addictive desires. Mm. And I think it leads us to something really interesting actually about addiction. I mean this explanation in terms of as it were consciousness changing, taking that the motive is for some people to take them away from themselves, is it brings out two aspects of addiction that aren't talked about in the rest of religion. One is the pejorative aspect. You know, why is it why do we why do we criticize the heroin addict or alcohol addict in a way that the smoker tends to get away with? Because it changes who they are. Because in some way they've escaped themselves, and in escaping themselves, they've escaped the thing that's going to enable them to rectify the situation, and they've started to damage the thing that you cared about in the first place. Okay. Hmm. Well, this is the. Danny and I wrote this paper as a result of being asked to to do a, a workshop on addiction and self knowledge, and and there was this feeling like you ask two philosophers to write about addiction, and lo and behold, they make some claim that philosophers are particularly good at being able to describe and sub and. and set out an account of. So are we like are we like the man who looks for his lost keys under the street lamp because that's where the light is? Well maybe, but I think it's it's notable that if Barrage and those guys are right, addiction and, and tuberculosis really shouldn't be we shouldn't expect philosophers to have more to say about one rather than the other. But I think we do expect philosophers to have more to say about one rather than the other and I'm trying to say something. Okay.